Good evening, everyone. Hopefully, the beginning of this week's live stream, or shall we say, the beginning of last week's live stream, which was somehow postponed. Um, I, I'll, I'll address that before we go any further. I don't know what happened. I had a strong and stable internet connection here by all the indicators that I could, um, you know, kind of look at, you know, um, the, uh, the, 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 computer was saying i was connected to the internet i did a, a speed test up and down uh speeds um you know on both the computer and on my phone and i was getting rock solid stable fast connection but i was just getting notifications from youtube saying i wasn't connected don't know what happened we'll just chalk it up for the moment to um just being one of those it gremlin things i think what may have been um possibly related to it was excuse me a sec good evening everyone um i'd uploaded all of this week's videos last friday the monday video the tuesday video the wednesday video the thursday video i'd uploaded them and whether youtube servers were still chewing on my uh uploads and processing them and i i don't know but something something happened anyway uh as is the case let's uh, as is always the case nowadays let me tell you what's coming up on the channel this week um tomorrow there is so let's see if i can get that glare off me noggin that's a, that's a bit better um tomorrow there is the usual saturday jam this week it is well, the title of the video is, uh, is this the ultimate scale for ja for dad rock? I almost said jazz rock then. It's basically the scale that you need to know about if you are, you know, into playing good old classic rock uh, and a bit of a jam and a lesson on that. Um, Monday, there is probably the heaviest guitar solo I've ever uh, done. Um, if I just say three words, Fast Eddie Clark, then you're probably going to know what uh, song that is uh tuesday i finally finally got the um the download right of the scuffum amps uh sk amp uh plugin um thank you to everybody who pointed out what a numpty i'd been by downloading the mac version um we'll chalk that one up to pilot error gotta tell you in advance i'm really really impressed with um with that software wednesday now wednesday is a bit of a special video i had a chap here today um came and saw me and brought a wonderful guitar that he built he's called dan and he's built the most exquisite beautiful custom built hand built twin humbucker telecaster style guitar and it is utterly gobsmackingly good and uh there's a review of that uh coming up on wednesday i think you can probably already tell how the review is going to end up it's a stunning guitar um thursday we're going to be probably looking at uh another style of guitars you know the kind of like this week it was the sg um if you have any suggestions um what what's that steve uh are you aware that youtube has removed the option for subscribers to receive email notifications to let them know when channels up uploaded new content uh, i didn't know that um and um, I do know that some people that I watch have been kind of saying that, um, you know, that some of their subscribers have been reporting that they'd been unsubscribed from the channel. Uh, there you go. That's Dan. Dan, uh, that's the guy who built that lovely guitar. Um, yes. Cheers, everyone. Uh, by the way, I'm on the San Miguel tonight. Uh, Dan, when he came up to review to bring me the guitar to review. Um, not that he was fishing for a good review, but he brought me four cans of beer. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. Evening, Craig. How are you, mate? Ah, uh, oh, dear mate. First one this week. I do like, I do like if I possibly can, to, to leave it till Friday. Yeah, so if anyone has any suggestions about um, what style of guitar to look at this Thursday... Um, you know, we're kind of, these videos seem really popular, but there's only a finite amount of, um, you know, options, isn't there? Because once you've done Les Paul, Strats, Telecasters, 335s, Gretches, Resonators, Les Paul Juniors, SGs and Super Strats, 
uh, that's what we've done so far. Um, it's you know I, I I don't want to kind of just continue it and feel like people and get people feeling like I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel for ideas. But um, if you have any suggestions, uh, please let me know. Um, John, a simple question: If you have to do a twelve bar solo in a song, do you count in your head or just rely on experience? Never seen this mentioned anywhere. Um, that's a good question, actually. Uh, it's basically a timing-related um, issue, isn't it? It's like, uh, you know, how far into the solo am I? How far into the 12-bar chord sequence am I? Which chord am I playing over? You can meticulously count it, but um, that's a little bit cumbersome, I find. Um, what I would say is, um, if you're looking for that, way of kind of being able to detect what chords you're playing over start by playing over two chords um this was um i think i mentioned ages ago this was uh, something that i first noticed i could do uh, when i was in a band that was covering the old eric clapton tune tulsa time which i think only has g and d in it and you know you can start to being able to hear where that crossover is from one chord to another and once you can do that um, then do something like a simple slow 12 bar blues where you've got uh, three chords in there and you're listening. Okay. So it's all about listening um, for what the chords are doing and then reacting. It's, I, I tend to think of it in, in terms of um, it being like a conversation. Um, how about acoustic or is that swearing? That's a good point, Jason. Yes. Um, right. Right. That's that's um, the uh, that that's this week's one. Then we're going to look at uh, dreadnoughts from the cheapest to the money no object uh, kind of option. You know what what guitar? You know we'll, 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 there's there's inevitably if we're looking at the cheapest, there's inevitably going to be a Harley Benton in there. I've got a Harley Benton dreadnought, and it's an absolutely stonking good guitar. Uh, hi, John. What's your take on the Roswells? Is it really worth the hassle of changing them? Uh, would not a mess with the amp setting do the same? Uh, P.S. Tar for the uh, tapping video. Yeah, um, no worries, mate. Glad you enjoyed the tapping video. Here's the thing about Roswell pickups. Um, they are good pickups if you like that particular tone. Um, all Roswell uh, humbuckers, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, all Roswell humbuckers are Alnico 5 magnets. I prefer Alnico 2. Um, so it's it, it, you could kind of mess with the amp controls, but there is an inherent sound there that um, that is just, I think, sweeter in the Alnico 2 magnet pickups. Um, but you could experiment with the amp controls. But that said... Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with Roswell pickups. If you like, um, what, what would they be like? Um, if, if you like the sound of maybe, um, a Seymour, Seymour Duncan 59, or maybe something like a, a Seymour Duncan, um, that kind of modern, well, 59 isn't really a modern pickup, but they are kind of a hot vintage humbug. They're more like, what would be in a kind of like a burst booker, kind of that, that sort of sound from Gibson. Um, and I just prefer something a bit mellower. So it's it's not a huge um, job, really, changing pickups. A little tip for you, actually. Um, from Music Man Guitars, years ago, when I first read the first review of Music Man Guitars, I think it was the silhouette when I first saw this, but they have just like kind of push fit connectors on the pickups. So no soldering. If you want to change the pickups, just, you know, obviously you've got to kind of go into the guitar and um, fit those connectors to begin with. But um, that's, you know, once it's done, it's done. And then any new pickups that you want to put in, just slot them in. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. Got chance of Alvarez electroacoustic. They, they, they get good reviews. You tried one or ever heard of them? No, uh, I haven't. But I did many, many years ago have um, 
an extended go on one of those Alvarez um, Super Strat style guitars that had like the big scoop cut out of them. Um, if you imagine where the neck joins the body um, on, a, on a Strat guitar and that kind of the lower kind of cutaway, well, that, that lower cutaway came all the way up and around the back of the, um, of the neck joint, you know, and it, it, uh, it was a very 80s kind of uh, thing, and um, surprisingly, or not, it didn't catch on. But other than that, it was it was a beautifully built guitar. So, um, I should add, it's called the Harley Benton DNA FX GIT. What's that all about, Jason? Sorry, I must have missed that. Evening, Colin. Um Hi, John, listening in my car on the way home from work in Dublin. No beer here yet. Well, get yourself home and get one uh, Get one uncorked, mate. Um, Ibanez tube screamer on eBay is £899. Yeah, now here's the thing. <laughs> As many of you probably know, I... Um, I studied electronics and telecommunications and um, basically it was marine electronics, basically to be a ship's radio officer at college many, many years ago. So I kind of know my way around a circuit diagram. And, you know, I remember there was uh, one of the um, electronics magazines that I used to kind of uh, read on a regular basis, published a circuit diagram for what they called a well-known guitar distortion unit um, that was, you know, that, that basically it, it, was a, it was a tube screamer and you could buy the components for the tube screamer, um, for this tube screamer circuit, including like the project case to put it in for about, and this is going back to ideally, the early 90s, um, you know, for like about 20 quid. <laughs> um, so... It's it was inevitable. The vintage market, the, the collectibles market, applies to you know its pedals, its guitars, its you know. Would I pay eight nine hundred quid for a, for a, an overdrive pedal? No. <laughs> uh, what's up, Colin? It's all your fault. I've been working way through the solo you demonstrated a while back. Thin Lizzy waiting for an alibi. Fingers hurt like hell, but series fun. Yeah, it's a great solo, that one. Um, great use of pentatonic harmonies in that one. Um, Dan's in, Dan Bernston. Uh, <laughs> settled in to watch the best show on TV with Brandy on hand. First drink in seven or eight weeks. Deary me. I don't know how you manage that, Dan. I really don't. Um so let's have a look at some of the other chat that I've been that I've missed as I've been kind of uh, going on. It's a new Harley Benton pedal. Uh, got good reviews so far, around 140 euros. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the wrong lad to ask for pedals, really, because I'm, I've never really been a big pedal kind of bloke, and that comes from being skint. Uh, when I was first learning, when I was first learning my craft as, as a gigging musician, um, I had a Laney Mighty 50 amp and a cheap Les Paul copy, and you know I think it was a Coron fuzz box that I used to use used to use for the really nasty stuff, but everything else it was just kind of working it from the guitar's volume control. Um, so all of this kind of thing of like having multiple different sounds on tap. Um, you know, I I I, um, I once had the extravagance, or I, I I got the extravagance at one point of a of a chorus pedal, and um, you know, and even that and the fuzz pedal, it was it was sort of confusing me. But I'm not a big pedal aficionado, so um, it's. Um, you know, I, I don't have any any problem with pedals, and I don't uh, I, I don't want to be like you know certain people who criticise anybody that's um, that loves a load of pedals. Dave Gilmore, I mean, one of my favourite guitar players. You know, he he's fond of a pedal or two, isn't he? Um, it's just not something that I have a lot of. 
I don't have a lot of investment in the whole kind of pedal scene. So, um, but if it's getting good reviews, I mean, the thing is, if it's if it comes from Toman and you don't like it, you've got thirty days to send it back anyway. So, yeah, a compressor can be a better bet than a distortion unit. Yeah, I did briefly used to use when I was in the cabaret uh, kind of thing. I I did use to briefly use a distort uh, a compressor pedal as a as like a clean boost. That was um, you know, a, a good thing. You, your lad needs a boost pedal. What's your recommendation on budget mid-price range? Is currently in a Chicago blues band. Um, right. Good boost pedal. Uh, ooh. Well, if you want something that's that's just going to kind of give you that nice kind of tip over the edge, just, I mean, there are any number of Tube Screamer clones out there. And... Uh, as you know, when I'm recording, I use a, a, a Tube Screamer VST as a bit of a boost. It um, The thing I like about the Tube Screamer circuit and the Tube Screamer kind of style of pedal is, and I still wouldn't pay 900 quid for a, for, for <laughs> a vintage one, um, is that when you plug a Strat in, even with a bit of gain on it and stuff, you can still tell it's a Strat or a Les Paul or a Telecaster or whatever. It still retains the, the character of the guitar. Um, Wilco Johnson once said, "Pedals. I'm a I'm a guitarist, not a cyclist." Yeah, yeah. The, the, there is that point of view. Um, maybe it's just because I'm a simple lad and I like a simple setup, and I kind of got used to early, very early on, being able to kind of dial in the sound on the guitar just using the, the volume control. Um, Can also get a good boost from a graphic equaliser. Uh, let's just ship. Yeah, very, very good point, mate. Yes. Um, what are my thoughts on Nils Lofgren? He's 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 a canny player. Um, what was that album he brought out? You know, because I mean, I suppose suppose like a lot of people, I'd never heard of Nils Lofgren until he released um, until he kind of replaced rather Steve Van Zant in Springsteen's band. Um. And then I, I, I checked him out, and he brought out an album round about the same time. Was it called Tilt or Flip or something like that? I remember having it at the time and really, really enjoying it. Um, it was... Um, but that's that to, that's the extent of my knowledge with him, uh, of him, rather. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah for, what I know of him is, uh, is impressive. So there you go. Um, Behringer do great pedals. Talking about pedals, I mean, this one, this Harley Benton British sound. Um, I bought this just to do the review because it was cheap enough that I could just chuck, I think, 27 quid at it to do a review. And um, because I'm sort of heavily into the amp sim thing at the moment, um, I'm not really getting a lot of use out of this. Um, so I'm thinking I might do some sort of giveaway on this, um, possibly some sort of competition, um, or we'll see. Um, so watch this space on that one. Uh, it's a great pedal, by the way. It's not really a boost pedal. Um, it basically, you know, if you believe the hype on this, it, um, it sounds like a, a bunch of different martial amps all in one box. And it, it kind of does. You could take this and plug it into some sort of bland, fairly bland, neutral-sounding, clean amp. Um, I don't know, some sort of PV solid-state amp or something like that. And, um, you know, kind of get that big, fat Marshall sound. Um, so, you know, there you go. Uh, watch this space. There's a giveaway coming up. I've just made my mind up. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. Have you or anyone else listened to Joanne Shaw Taylor's last album, Reckless Heart? Love that spanky blues sound, and she's got a great, great voice. I first heard of her, actually, uh, Joanne Shaw Taylor. Um, she was, uh, there was one of her tracks on, do you remember when guitar magazines used to give away CDs? I remember when they used to give away those little flexi discs <laughs> before CDs. But I, I first heard of Joanne Shaw Taylor, one of the tracks on, um, 
on one of those guitar magazine CDs, but it was in that awkward sort of period of the mid nineties when you could hear a track by an artist and think, I'll check that person out. And then you go to your local record shop and that there's nothing there. Um, and this was, you know, a few years later, you know, the internet comes along and, you know, you can kind of Google them and listen to them and check them out a little bit more. Um, so I should maybe check her out. Um, Nils Lofgren, check out Silver Lining, great guitar work. Get John to keep drinking, he might give some guitars away as well. <laughs> we would be here some significant time um, for that to happen. <laughs> um, but, yes, anyway, what's it? Um, yeah, what's that? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read the read the. Uh, chat and I keep scrolling up could you do a vid on improvisation my problem on learning other people's stuff uh, is at the end of the day still there's yes now funny you should mention that I've been doing a lot of that in lessons with uh, people at the moment is just kind of developing the knack of being able to play something out of nothing um, the the biggest thing does this sound familiar when when you're going to improvise is um it's like you're staring at a blank canvas and suddenly you've got to kind of create something on that canvas and it's like well where do you start where do you place the first brush stroke so yeah that's a great great idea um that will be coming up um very very soon i should think Uh, hi, John. D did you ever have experience with the Washburn Tornwood Mercury series? My recently, first recently. Do you know what, Neil? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know the whole kind of Tornwood debate that's been going on uh, forever, I guess, ever since guitarists got internet connections and, and started posting on message boards. Now, I'm sort of on the fence with the whole Tornwood thing. Do I think it matters a bit, but not as much as many people claim it matters, um, is, is, is sort of where I'm at with it. And in some cases, it matters more, and in other cases, it matters less. But these Washburn guitars, they were like sort of super strat guitars. If these are the ones that you're talking about, Neil, um, which I think they might be, in the 90s, at some point, Washburn brought out this range of guitars that were like sort of super strat style guitars. And I think, if memory serves me right, you could buy one with an ash body. You could buy the same guitar either with an ash body, a mahogany body, and I think the other one was Paduke or Paduak or however it's pronounced. And, you know... And this was going to be like, you know, you could you could buy the guitar that, that, that had the tone that appealed to you. And they didn't last. It, it didn't kind of go, uh, it didn't kind of go viral, as they would say these days. Um, and I think I know why. It's because I spent an afternoon in a music shop, uh, the, the local Washburn dealer, um, trying these guitars out. And... You know, the, there was more difference between, like, the the Ash guitar and another Ash guitar that I took off the uh, rack, you know, because obviously they had more than uh, one of each model in stock. There was more difference between two of supposedly identical guitars than there was between one of those and one with a different body wood. So, I don't know. I mean, who knows? But it's... Um, I, I've been racking my brains and, you know, whenever you Google that series of guitars, the, there's nothing kind of out there about them, but thank you um, for, you know, kind of <laughs> reminding me of those. Does plywood make that much difference? Let me tell you about a plywood guitar. My first Squire Strat um, that I had, um, I, my first Fender Stratocaster was the uh, Fender Heavy Metal Strat. Yeah, I know, it's hardly me, is it? But anyway, this was the 80s. Um, uh, 
and I wanted a backup guitar because I was gigging. So I bought a Squire Strat and I didn't know at the time. It was just like a, I wanted a Strat and it was like, it was sort of a cheap Fender uh, or Fender Associated, you know. Um, and I bought a Squire Strat. Didn't know that it had um, a plywood body back then. Um, and gigged with it quite happily and got a great sound out of it. So there you go. I think the whole thing with plywood guitars was that was that was killed by the Yamaha Pacifica, wasn't it? Uh, because, you know, Squire were putting out plywood guitars, Encore were putting out plywood guitars, and then for around about the same money, Yamaha, Yamaha brought out the Pacifica 112 with a clear natural finish so you could see it wasn't made from plywood. And, and that sort of shamed the other manufacturers into not using plywood. Um, uh, hi, John. Just got Dan Irwin's book and saw that his string height is barely one millimeter on the high E. How does anyone play with an action that low? Uh, 1.5 millimeter is about as low as I can stand. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Excuse me, I'm a bit scratty today. The allergies are kicking in. It's that time of year. Um, I have no no idea what the string height is on any of my guitars. I don't measure it. I don't set guitar my guitars up by the numbers, I must admit. I just kind of set them up until I get the, the action where it feels comfortable and there's no fret buzz. And that's, that's always been my guide. And um, actually... Um, did a, a thing the other day. Have I, have I got them handy? No, I don't know where they are. Um, I did a thing the other day where, because um, I always set the bridge saddles up, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, the, the, the the radius on the bridge saddles, I always set that up um, by, just by feel, really. And um, got some radius uh, gauges uh, a little while ago and um, just checked the uh, Olami guitars. And just by feel alone, it seems I've set up all of the uh, the bridge saddles on all of my guitars exactly correctly, um, you know, to, to, to match the neck, which is um, which is reassuring. When is the last time you played live, and do you miss it? Okay, the last time I played live was. Um, not counting sort of open mic nights and stuff like that. Um, the last time I played live was, I think, in 2014. So that's about six years ago. And no, I don't miss it. Um, I know as a musician, you are supposed to kind of say that you love the buzz of being on stage and you love the, the you know, whatever. Um, the the whole thing with playing live it's it's like it's 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 hard work you know it i don't mean the actual standing on stage bit and playing music i enjoy that okay but the whole thing of humping bass bins up and down huge flights of stairs and you know getting in at one o'clock in the morning and then having to be up early again for you know for kind of work or whatever the next morning and you know, it's it it kind of grinds at me, grinds at you a little bit. And then there's has has anybody ever been in that band, that band that I think we've all been in from time to time, where you spend six months in the rehearsal room and never get any tighter because there's always somebody that turns up that hasn't learned the parts or who's forgotten the lyrics or who's forgotten the bass line or you know drummers who can't count to four. You know that that kind of band. Well. That's the majority of bands I've been in over the years, and it's just, it's a soul-destroying kind of thing. Um, as soon as I started getting into the, the the whole teaching thing, which was, in I guess, in the early 90s, and started realising that I really loved the, the, the teaching, and then home recording and stuff, um, you know, I, I kind of realised that I'd sort of found my niche, really. Um, you know... Playing live is good. Readying yourself, readying yourself, and band politics. Yeah, exactly, mate. Um, 
it's the, the band politics again. That's that's another thing. Oh well, why can't we do this song? I why well, can we only do the songs that you choose? And uh, da, 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 da. you know, it's it's just all of that kind of that mute musicians can be. And I probably I probably would include myself in this in some disc in some way, shape, or form. Musicians can be um, you know crybabies in a lot of senses. Um, live music is all. Is so nineties. It's all about YouTube these days. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, the music industry. I I would contend. If you are a band, once upon a time, or if you're in a band, once upon a time, you would go on tour to sell copies of the album because that's where you made your money. Nowadays, you release an album to sell tickets for the tour because that's where you make your money. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how the music business as a whole recovers from the current situation, you know, what with live music being kind of verboten, as it were. Um, so, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed, I, I wouldn't, I, I did 10 solid years of, well, I did 10 years of regular live gigging and probably a bit more than that actually and then just it gradually sort of tailed off and by the time by the time it got to 2014 it was like yeah uh, this this isn't this isn't something I'm going to pursue I didn't actually ever decide I was going to quit it was just like you know when a band comes to an end when there's a natural conclusion to things um it, it just became well if I get an offer then I'll consider it, but by then I was more into the um, into the kind of YouTube and the t tuition and making videos and kind of recording and stuff. So, um, uh, where are we? Uh, yeah, bands always have one lazy bastard. They do indeed. And do you know the reason why you can never fire that person? It's because that's always the person that owns the PA system or the lighting rig, or that's the one, that's the lad who's got the uh, contact with the agent, or you know, or or something like that. There's always they always know when they can um, get away with it. I mean, um, I, I remember being in one band uh, one time, and this singer, I mean, I shan't mention his name um because he's probably out there and he's a cracking singer imagine someone with a voice that was like a cross between robert plant paul rogers and who else probably um what's he called the, the guy out of uh, judas priest rob halford imagine with a guy that, with that kind of range fantastic singer an absolute rock star on stage as well, you know. You know the the whole kind of you know even in the smallest pub gig, he was, you know, playing at Wembley and he carried it off and he was fantastic. But he was the most born idle person. I was going to say something else then. Uh, he was the most born idle lad you you would ever meet. He would not learn the songs. He would not, you know, help carry the gear in and lump the gear out. He was just the most, you know, it's it's like he was just lazy. And um, in the end, in the end, he did end up getting fired. Well, no, he didn't. He didn't get fired. He uh, he quit when he knew the firing was on the cards. But uh, he lasted a good couple of years longer than he would have done if it hadn't been for that amazing voice. I enjoy playing live, but I played audience friendly sets for 25 years. Now I want to start doing a bit more of the stuff I enjoy. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, um, if you want to gig regular in this part of the world, or certainly when I was gigging, and we're talking about from the late 80s, I guess, to about 2014, um, then the you, you've got to kind of play on what's called the, the, the club band circuit or the cabaret circuit, basically playing working men's clubs and stuff like that. And, you know, and 
it's just all sort of top well you know back when i was doing it you know regularly it was it was top 40 and kind of pop rock and um you know it was bon jovi def leppard brian adams not there's anything wrong with that sort of stuff i don't want to disparage that but you know if you want to kind of maybe do your own stuff or whatever then you had to be prepared for the the prospect that you just weren't going to be gigging regularly Uh, let's have a read of some more of the chat. Uh, I found as I've got older, I don't listen to much new music. Excuse me, I just need to scroll back up to read that one. Oh, I've knocked the beer can over. Um, uh, saw the small fakers, small faces in a small pub, and they were brilliant. Yep. Yeah, um, here's the thing with tribute bands. They come in for a lot of stick, but I have ultimate respect for them. If you've not seen, by the way, talking about tribute bands, this isn't really a tribute band, although I guess it kind of is. I'm sure many of you lads know this this band, but check out on YouTube uh, the classic rock show. What a band they are. Uh, Pete Thorne's playing with them at the moment, although I guess they're not really doing much at the moment, but there is some footage of him out there playing with them. And what a band. What a fantastic band they are. Uh, it's, you know, Steely Dan, Eagles, Bad Company, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, Dire Straits. It's just all the good stuff, you know, dad rock, basically. Um, and the, the thing about tribute bands is they're keeping that music alive, I think. Um, in an age when, for instance, certain well-known uh, bands will block anything on YouTube and get videos taken down that's a cover of their music. Um, then, you know, we need bands like the, the, the well-known tribute bands. I've seen, um, oh, I can't remember what they were called now, um, a fantastic ACDC tribute band, um, you know, doing... At, uh, at a local venue, uh, Eric Clapton tribute act, and you know, brilliant stuff, uh, brilliant stuff. And they're keeping that music alive. Okay, imagine if someone was, was to say, Oh, you, I, I'm going to the symphony tonight. Oh, yes, really? Well, it's not Mozart playing, so I shan't be going. You know, it's you, you've got to keep that, you've got to keep the music alive. And uh, as the original purveyors of that music are, you know, either getting too old to kind of go out and tour or aren't, bit, aren't there anymore, then, you know, it, it needs some, it needs people to go out and play that music and, and keep it alive, really, I think. Anyway. Uh, no, it wasn't Dirty DC and Airborne. Yes, they are the world's, uh, they are uh, a bit of an ACDC tribute band. Um Check out the Rio Brothers, mainly Beatles covers, but very uh, tight, good musicians. Um, I want to do a Blondie's cover, Blondie covers band. That, that'd be something. Um, a drummer I was in a band with uh, a few years ago, actually, sadly no longer with us, actually. Um, he, um, yeah, uh, that's another story. But anyway, um, this drummer, he, he was kind of... Um, Kind of hitting me up to do a Slade cover, a Slade tribute band. There isn't, there aren't any Slade tribute bands out there, and I think the reason for that is because no one can sing like Noddy Holder. Um, it's, but you know, wouldn't that be a great band to go and see? I mean, I'd, I'd be there like a shot, a Slade tribute band. The thing I, the, the only problem I sometimes, I guess, have with tribute bands is, um, the. <sighs> I don't like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of impersonators, you know, where a band goes out and tries to look like the original, like, like that band, you know, that, that's, that's not really, I think that's taking it a stage too far. Um, a, a fantastic, fantastic guitar player up in this neck of the woods who I've spoken about many, many times, a guy called Andy Power. Um, he did uh, a tour with this Elvis tribute, and I went to see them. I'm not the world's biggest Elvis fan, but I went to see them at a local venue, the Billingham Forum, and because um, it was like part of a nationwide tour that he was doing with them. And, you know, this guy came on, and he looked a bit like Elvis, but he wasn't trying to be Elvis, you know. And, um, 
you know, and he, he first said, like, can I just say right from the off there, was only ever one Elvis Presley. I'm not trying to be a, a tribute to him. I'm not trying to be an impersonator of him. This is an Elvis tribute, not an impersonation. And that's the kind of, uh, that's the balance I would like to strike. I, I like people to strike. Um, nobody could wear Noddy socks either. Yes, well, that was the 70s, wasn't it? <laughs> Who gets to wear their hair, hair like Dave Hill? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Chris rem remembers the Billingham Forum as well. Yes. Um, uh, I hear there is an ACDC tribute band called ACDC who were on <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um Talking about tribute bands, does anyone remember from the early 90s um, a band called Dread Zeppelin? They were the most weird thing that you've ever imagined. They were a Led Zeppelin covers band, but they did, the, they did all Led Zeppelin covers, but in reggae and ska kind of uh, genre, in, in that style. And they were fronted by an Elvis impersonator. It sounds mad and it doesn't add up, but somehow when you heard them, it did. Another great band, I think they're called Staying Alive, who are a heavy metal Bee Gees tribute band. Yeah, yeah, you remember Dread Zeppelin as well, do you? <laughs> How relevant is a classic band down to one or two members? Trigger's new broom. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the case in point was the solo I put up this week, wasn't it? Um, if anybody doesn't know the the uh, the Trigger's new broom uh, or Trigger's old broom, there was a sitcom in the UK called Only Fools and Horses, and there was a, a character called Trigger who was a road sweeper, and he was a bit dim. And, you know, he says, look at this broom. I've had this for 14 years. And in that time, it's only had three new heads and 10 new shafts. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I get your point. I mean, I did a, a, a thing this week on uh, Wishbone Ash. I mean, Andy, pa it might as well be the Andy Powell band, mightn't it? Because he's the only consistent uh, member. Um, but, you know, bands evolve, don't they? Um I'm thinking, has there has there been any <coughs> band from, let's say, the 70s to the current day who are still around, still either touring or or releasing albums, and still have the same lineup? I can't think of any offhand. Um, thank you, Com. That was that's very generous of you, mate. That'll uh, that'll buy me. Um, That'll buy me four tins of Aldi Lager. <laughs> um, there was a guy in the 90s called The King. He sang modern songs exactly like Elvis. I used to play it in my shop and people... Uh, I never heard of that guy. Um, I, shall, um, I shall have to, in an idle moment, I shall have to have a look on YouTube for that. Oh, hey, see, Dixie. Yes. Um... AC Dixie, yeah, they weren't so much an ACDC covers band. They were just um, kind of a bluegrass band, weren't, aren't they? I suppose they're still out there, um, who just do classic rock stuff in in a kind of bluegrass banjo kind of, um, you know, deliverance style manner. Um, their version of Ace of Spades is fantastic. Um <laughs> Same guitar, only had uh, new pickups and two new necks and four bodies. Yeah, that's the thing. That's yeah, that's triggers broom. <coughs> um, here, see Dixie were playing in Sunderland a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, I remember um, they were on. Does anybody um, ever watch the One Show on BBC? <laughs> um, um, occasionally the wife would have it on, but uh, she knows better now. <laughs> no, only kidding. Um, but yeah, they, they played live on there, and that was that was incredible, fantastic. Um, bon Jordi, 
Yes, they were a great band. Um, the Bon Jovi covers band from Newcastle, hence Bon Jordi. Um, the Reet Hot Chili Peppers were some good Northeast covers band. Yes. <laughs> I was very, very briefly, and this is going back to about 2014, um, in. Uh, involved in, let's say, involved in the setting up of a band that never came to anything, um, of a Guns N' Roses cover band um, uh, that had a female singer, uh, and they were going to be called Roses Gun. Um, but the thing is, a Guns N' Roses cover band, if, you, if you're going to go out and do a set of, you know, kind of all the hits, you struggle, really, to kind of make a two hour on even 90 minute set out of, you know, all the guns and roses. Yes, you can do album tracks and stuff, I guess, but you know, you, you've got to kind of appeal to the mass market to, to get kind of bums on seats. And there just wasn't enough material there really. Uh, So Aussie Pink Floyd two years ago, amazing. So the Pink Floyd experience, Roxy, Ma Roxy Magic and Let Zep. I've seen Let Zep. Yes, they were on the same bill as the uh, that ACDC covers band that I can't for the life of me rem remember the name of. Um, talking about um, tribute bands, as we seem to be doing. Um, are Limehouse Lizzie still on the go? Because they were absolutely fantastic. Again, another band I saw at the Billingham Forum, and they did the entire Live and Dangerous album. That was that was the kind of set they were doing on that tour, and they were fantastic. And they were just struck that right balance between, you know, the, the singer looked a bit like Phil in it, but he wasn't trying too hard, you know. Um, and what a what a fantastic band! And I don't know whether you'd call this a tribute band, because they weren't really. But um, another fantastic band I saw was um, a band called A Company of Snakes, and it was basically um, all the original lineup of White Snake minus um, David Coverdale. Uh, so it was Mickey Moody, Bernie Marsden. And I can't remember who else was, but it was basically that original lineup of White Snake, and with, with with a new singer, and they absolutely nailed that early White Snake kind of area. You know, before when, do you remember when White Snake were good? You know, before they were all kind of uh, poodle perm and spandex. Um, where are we? It's hard to find the world's best tribute band. The the cover tracks so well. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a fella on YouTube was in the Aussie and Brit Pink Floyd check out Bobby Harrison. I shall do that again. Um, let me let me describe my week to you. Um, it's basically work, 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 work. Um, although you know what you can you could argue that what I do isn't really work. The only time I really have um chance to kind of sit down and listen to music or read a book and you know kind of relax and chill out and watch youtube stuff is kind of sunday evenings uh because there's let, let's face it what's on television on a sunday evening um the hamsters were good yes they were i saw them live many times um so um you know that that'll be slated up for uh, th this this weekend actually on a sunday uh what's it called bobby harrison yes i shall um I shall be watching those, watching him rather. Um, Queen tribute bands are pretty thin on the ground, but that's Freddie Mercury for you. There's a band, or there used to be a band in the northeast on the on the circuit round here, around about the same time as I was doing the club circuit, and I think they were called Magic. Um, and. They weren't really a Queen tribute band because they did other uh, stuff as well. But um, they used to do Bohemian Rhapsody in its entirety, even the bit that Queen used to kind of chicken out of live. And dearie me, they were good. Dearie me, they were really, really good. 
Weren't Queen of Sparks tribute band? Ah, I think that's a bit of a stretch, to be honest with you. Uh, um, uh, I like your approach to music theory teaching, but still waiting for your course uh, when you find the time. Uh, email me, Chris. Um, I've had, I, if um, if I've missed one of the um, one of the uh, Patreon courses that I, that I promised, then I do apologise. Um, Email me. It's jrguitartuition at gmail dot com, and you can find the the link to me website where you can email me in the uh, on all the videos. Uh, I do apologise if I've missed if I've missed the if I've neglected to send you a course. Uh, I do apologise, but yeah, email me and let me know which course you want, and um, I will uh, I will rectify that asap. I'm sure there was an all male Dixie Chicks tribute band called Chicks with Dixies. <laughs> Maybe there was. <laughs> um, I like pub bands. Only reason to go to a pub, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean that was. There's a there's a pub. Um, excuse me, last beer. So this will have to be um, on the on the way to winding things up um there, there's a pub just around the corner from me called O'Grady's you know typical sort of um you know full Irish pub and they have bands on all the time and it's it's a great little venue um and as I say you know there's there's a lot of uh, gigging musicians who are at the moment you know kind of sitting at home and uh, twiddling the thumbs and I just hope the uh, scene does kind of come back from it i think to be honest with you i think it will because people are always people always want to go and see live music and there are musicians unlike me it has to be said <laughs> who do miss that buzz from playing live um so you know I, I just think it's and let's face it how many how many gigging musicians are doing it purely for the for the money you know, so as soon as the opportunity to play live comes back, I can see I can see it being like you know, kind of just unleashing the floodgates. Um, Deep Purple were a Vanilla Fudge tribute. Now, maybe there's some truth in that. Um, dear me, I thought I was the only person who kind of knew of Vanilla Fudge. Um, whatever happened to them? Um, Craig, you missed the buzz from playing live. Well, good for you, mate. Um, I must say that, you know, being um, well past my 50th birthday and having done that whole live thing and, and kind of ticked that box, it's like, you know, I'm not saying I would never do it again, never say never, but, um, you know, if the opportunity came along and, and, and circumstances were right, then, yeah, fair enough. But um, it's not something I'm... Uh, oh, well, thank you very much, mate. Um, that's very, very kind of you. Uh, that's Johnny there. He's he's bought me a few beers. Can I just say um, the super chat is I, I do appreciate it, but um, and I don't want to appear ungrateful because I really, really am grateful. Um, but you know, if you if you're feeling generous, go and give it to Zoe's place. Um, you know, so there you go. Um, much appreciated, but um, give it to Zoe's place. They they kind of need it, you know. I just I, I like money. They need it. <laughs> uh, what about busking? Um, here's the thing about busking. Um, it's kind of um, an important part of that job description is that you you kind of need to be able to sing. And um, every band I've ever been in, every single band I've ever been in, you know, rehearsals, it's like, um, can we get some vocals off you, John? Yeah, no problem. So I start singing and, you know, and the next rehearsal is never, ever a mic set up for me. <laughs> Even my missus says the only way you'll ever carry a tune is in a bucket. Um, <laughs> the gramophone will be mark the death of live music. Mark my words. <laughs> uh, 
these bands such as the Rolling Stones, the Who, etc., etc., who have been going for millions, have a different mindset to us. Yeah, they also have the luxury. I mean, when you're talking about the Who um, or the Rolling Stones or, or any band like that, they entered the music business when the music business had an entirely different business model and they prospered from that. And now it's a case of, you know, I mean, um, you know, the Rolling Stones will just go out and kind of do a tour or, or, or whatever, or do whatever they want to do um, and not care if they make money because they don't need to make money from it because, you know, each and every one of them is, you know, probably on the Sunday Times rich list. Um, uh, could you, hi John, could you do some Tommy Emmanuel? Um, <laughs> I would have to have me Weetabix that morning, wouldn't I? <laughs> He's good, isn't he? Tommy Emmanuel. Um, <laughs> Rolling Stones, John, surely means strolling bones. Yes. Um, excuse me, there's my phone. I forgot to put it on ignore earlier. Let me just see who's mithering me. Um, Oh, it's a mate of mine. He's on the beer and he's just, I, I have this mate down south, um, down in um, that there London. And um, we have this kind of thing, whenever he uncorks a beer, um, he, he always kind of uh, texts me broadsword calling Danny Boy. If you know that reference, then you're, then you're a real fan of classic, uh, <laughs> classic um, Clint Eastwood films. Um but yeah, that was just in there giving me the broadsword calling Danny Boy text. So there we go. Um, um, Steve is saying, fancy a few lessons around the Joanne Shaw Taylor album. John. Steve, man, mate, I mean, no problem, but you know, we've only just kind of got you into doing a little bit of kind of Satriani kind of legato. Uh, Simon Cowell, I'm busy selling the illusion and ripping off. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. Here's the thing about, about Cowell. Um, by the way, did you, did you know that, um, he was recently voted the best dressed man on television? Yeah, really. Um, I think it's probably cause he spent so much time in the closet, but there you go. Um, anyway, yeah. The thing about that style of, um, of pop music is it's always existed and there have always been um, Simon Cowell type characters around. Um, just Google the name Larry Parnes. Um, or I think it was Stig Anderson who uh, was the guy behind Abba in the seventies. Those kind of people have, have always been around. Um, and yet great music has always come out of it. You know, I mean, back in the eighties, people were kind of, Oh, isn't it horrible that, that stock Aitken and Waterman as a kind of ruling the roost? Well, yeah. But then again, in the eighties, you still had, you know, artists like Peter Gabriel and, um, you know, Jeff Healy came out in the eighties and, you know, and, you know, loads of great music came out in the 80s, despite the fact that Stock Aitken and Waterman, Mel and Kim, Kylie and Jason and all that sort of stuff was was there. So, you know, um, there you go. That's my thoughts on it anyway. Um, Mickey Most, there you go. Um, yeah, he was... Um, he was the guy, be, I mean, without Mickey Most, the, the world would never have really kind of um, heard much of Jeff Beck because, you know, Mickey Most was the guy behind um, High Horse Silver Lining, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, have you have you thought of covering Oasis Live Forever Soul? I like the Don't Look Back in Anger Soul. You did great back in track two thank you yeah um i have thought of doing that and i will probably get around to doing it um what i'm trying to do with these solos is not kind of revisit the same artist uh too soon um i'm just give, to give you a little bit of a sneak peek um i'm currently kind of sifting through my uh, rory gallagher collection to find a solo that is because the one thing you can say about rory gallagher is 
you know, most of his solos, he rarely played a short one, did he? Um, so I'm trying to find a, a solo that's suitable to do like a 10, 15 minute video on where I can do it justice in that amount of time. Um, so maybe there, there will be a Rory Gallagher solo coming on. Yeah, Shadow Play or, you know, uh, Follow Me or, um, I mean, my personal favourite Rory Gallagher album has to be a live album. And I think Stage Struck is a fantastic live album. Um, you know, but again, a lot of the solos on, on these albums with, with the containers' best performances, the, the live albums, tend to be a bit lengthy. And it's like, this is going to end up being a 40-minute video, um, you know. Uh, where are we? Shin Kicker, yeah, fantastic track. Fantastic track. Um, uh, John, do you too solo video play two notes and add some delay? Easy, easy to just work it. Have you seen the uh, the Bill Bailey skit on um, on the edges guitar style? It's it's really just just Google uh, or YouTube search um, Bill Bailey the Edge. It's fantastic. Um, Rory Gallagher, too much alcohol. Yeah, again, fantastic. I mean, again, I'm, 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 I mean, the, the temptation with these solo videos is it could be, it could very well end up if if I was left to my own devices, being um, a Gary Moore or an Eric, Gary Moore or an Eric Clapton solo each week. So I've got to kind of try and dial that back a bit. Anyway, chaps. Um, my belly is telling me that it's ready for chili because uh, that's what's on the menu tonight. And um, I'm kind of towards the end of my last beer. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for turning up after the debacle last week when uh, things went a bit pear-shaped. Uh, thankfully, we, um, we, we survived this evening. Uh, the live streams will continue. Um... If we get any more gremlins on YouTube, then they may continue on another platform, but they will continue. But for the moment, thank you once again, everyone, for turning up. I'm going to go and have me dinner now because I'm hungry. Uh, the beer has sharpened my appetite a little bit. Uh, so with, um, you know, with that, I'll just bid you all a good day and uh, have a great weekend and time, gentlemen, please. I'll see you all next time, folks. Bye for now.